All right, so hello everyone. My name is Licha Canton and I'm the founding editor-in-chief of Achenti Magazine. Welcome to Achenti's Countering Isolation with Creativity, a project made possible through the financial support of Employment and Social Development Canada as part of the New Horizons Seniors Program. This is the third workshop in a series of 10. Welcome to Vincenzo Pietropaolo's Photographs as Inspiration for Writing. For those of you who may not know him, let me say something very briefly about Vincenzo. Um, he has published over a dozen books combining photographs and original texts that explore social issues. His work has appeared in literary and academic journals. He is a contributing editor to Point, at Point of View magazine, and he's a member of the Writers' Union of Canada. And we're so excited to have him give this workshop. Vincenzo, over to you. Thank you very much, Nietzsche, and uh, hello everyone, good afternoon, or good morning, or good evening, perhaps, uh, with, with some of you. Um, I um, would like to, first of all, um, acknowledge the fact that, uh, respectfully, that um, the land on which I live and work um, and practice my, my art has been a site of human activity for over 15,000 years. The land, um, where I am located is the city of Toronto, and it is also the territory of the Huron-Wendat and the Piton First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Predator River. And today the meeting place of Toronto is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And I think that we all have to be mindful of broken covenants and the need to strive to make right with uh, all of our relations on, uh, on this land. Um, before I start the workshop, I want to ask people, where are you all coming from? I know that uh, Tina is coming from around the corner, from Tina, from Madame for Perth, and Rosaida is a neighbor um, a few blocks away. Um, and Pasquale, are you in California? Or are you? I'm, I'm in San Diego, yes. You're in San Diego, w wonderful. And, and Jane, I'm in uh, Vancouver. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> and Kelly? Mm -hmm. um, I'm in Warren Heights in the, in the Laurentians. I live in Montreal, but I've been up north for the last couple of months. And, 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 and uh, Femia? I'm in uh, Greek town in Toronto. Okay, so we have at least a couple of people from Toronto. And Stephanie? I'm in Oakville, Ontario, just yeah. outside of Toronto. Yeah, I, I, it's amazing how Zoom has actually changed our lives and in a way because, you, you know, created bridges um, uh, from across continents, you know. Mm. Anyways, uh, today my talk is about, um, and my workshop is about how photographs can be an inspiration for, uh, for writing. And I'll explain briefly the format that, we're, that I'll follow. Uh, I'll first give a, a short talk on the nature of photography and um, their, uh, the, the, relation, the relation of photographs to words, the relationship of, you know, how, how they deal with each other. In other words, how do we read photographs? Uh, I'll be showing um, about four sets of photographs uh, of two each. Each set has two photographs. I'll give you about, a, I'll share my screen with you. And uh, you'll find that I'll be sharing my screen on and off throughout the, throughout the workshop. And I'll give you about a minute to look at them and write down what your first reaction is or uh, your first impressions, including maybe what is happening, what do you think is happening, when, where, uh, anything at all about the photograph and just jot, jot that down. Um, and uh, I'll give you, I, I like everyone to have an opportunity to speak. So please don't be shy. We're um, a nice, you know, manageable group, 10 people, it's, it's wonderful. And so um, everybody's opinion counts and everyone has a, an opinion about uh, photographs. Um, after we look at the photographs, the first two photographs, and we have a little, maybe a 10 minute discussion, um, we'll, um, um, I'll read to you, I'll, I'll put on the screen um, what my description or my intent in making that picture was, okay? And, um, and also, um, and then we'll uh, repeat that process again with the other, with the other photographs. And at the end, um, I plan to have enough time to have a general discussion uh, at, at, the, at the end, okay? And I'll also assign some, uh, <clears throat> some homework, which is, which consists of a, a watching a film. So you'll, you'll love this film. Um, I'll place the, uh, the link on the chat. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll start by sharing my screen now. 
And um, let's see if it's working properly. And voila. So welcome to the workshop. First question I have for people, I know some people have, have thought a lot about photography and some maybe have you know thought about a photography professionally perhaps, but some haven't. What is photography in essence? And if you if you go back to the etymological roots of the word, it comes from the Greek photos and graphos, which means light and to draw or to make graphics. So my interpretation is the photography means to draw or to write with light. So if you think of that, um, then it becomes easier to understand. As a visual language, photography is really universal because you don't need to speak English or Greek or Chinese or whatever in order to understand the photograph. Of course, there are cultural references all the time, but that's, that's really another matter. Uh, another question I have for you to think about is, why are photographs so powerful? There are many reasons. Um, I think that the, uh, the most obvious reason is because a photograph is a realistic representation of reality, whatever reality is, okay? A photograph usually has intent. It's there for a purpose. Uh, it has a point of view and it also has a visual perspective. And, and a photograph only exists because it's, a, it's made possible by the action of light on, uh, on chemistry until digital technology came along and that changes everything. And that's like an entire discussion that we can have uh, towards, towards the end. But a photograph can often be very ambiguous because if I show you a picture, you have no idea where that picture comes from and it's out of context in terms of time, in terms of place. So, but when you attach words to a photograph, when you write a story about a photograph, when you attach even a title to a photograph, it, I think it changes everything. Um, now, my, one of my favorite writers is John Berger. And John Berger, I think he died about three years ago, I believe, and he was an English writer uh, who wrote, he was an art critic, a novelist, a poet, uh, he also made drawings uh, and he wrote lots of essays, a tremendous essay writer. And he actually has an incredible definition, uh, an incredible, I think, analysis of uh, phot photographs and words. I think you can read this on your own, but I like to read it myself also. The photograph begs for an interpretation and the words usually supply it. The photograph, which is irrefutable as evidence for weak in meaning, is given word meaning by the by the words, and the words which by themselves remain at the level of generalization, are given specific authenticity by the irrefutability of the photograph. Together, the two become very powerful, and the, and become another way of telling. This is a heavy statement, so we'll try and, and just dissect very quickly. I think his key words, the key words in his statement, in Berger's statements, are interpretation. Uh, if you ask two, you know, two, two different people, what is the picture of each, you know, each will interpret it in their own way. Uh, it is irrefutable as evidence. Aha, uh -huh. I know you know that there's an asterisk. And that was that was the case um, until technological developments made it possible to actually change the nature of the photograph and to change and to change the to change the contents. Without even re without even becoming obvious, so I think Photoshop, for example, is a, an incredible tool. That today, can you really believe a photograph anymore? You know, that's a big big question. And uh, meaning, the photograph has, is is imbued, embedded with meaning, and of course, it, it's a story. Uh, photographs tell stories. Uh, and with that, um, I'm going to go to the first two pictures. So I'm going to ask you to maybe, maybe Maria Pia, you can tell me when we have a minute up. And please, please choose one of the two photographs. And you can choose both if you like, but at least one of them. And um, write down what you think it's about. What, what it makes, what it evokes in you.
It doesn't have to be, it can be in point form. Okay. Has the minute gone up maybe? Almost. Okay, I'll leave it up to Maria. Yeah. Now. Okay, so I'll stop sharing the screen. And we're all back together. So, um, I mean, I know what their pictures are because I made those photographs and I made them for a purpose. Although sometimes I didn't even realize what the purpose was until afterwards. So that's also a very interesting point about photography. Who would like to go first, venture first? Uh, about, uh, about uh, let's say we start with photograph number one. Who liked photograph number one? Uh, well, I commented in the chat. Um... I wasn't sure if we were supposed to, but I'll just read what I had written in the okay. chat um, about photo one. Um, and I just said, watching and waiting, that was my immediate reaction when I saw it. There's a sense of connection with people standing shoulder to shoulder and their eyes are pointing in the same direction as if they're waiting or anticipating for something. Mm -hmm. There's a sense of anticipation. Um, I also, Although I was attracted to the second one because of the playfulness in it, I kept going to the first one. One, because it's very familiar to me, a version of it is uh, I use as a cover in one of my books way back. And, uh, but what really strikes me in that photograph is a young man, the gaze of a young man on the, I guess it would be on the left as we're facing it with those dark circles around his eyes. It just keeps shifting my gaze <laughs> from the, the older couple that of course brings up all sorts of emotions as an older generation, but, but that young man over their shoulder is really, it's both uh, an irrefutable, I guess, <laughs> presence um, and ominous in, in, in certain ways. Huh? Yeah, that's uh, that's very interesting because the young man <clears throat> doesn't appear to be related to that couple. No, but they're related to that couple. Now the three of them are related by the photograph. The right, photograph. Exactly. In a sense, by by the photographer uh, composing the picture in the, in, in the way I in, in my case, you know, it's, I'm the photographer, so in the way I did, um, is I I put them in in a, way, in a sense I put them in the same circle, and he's gazing at me. And I'm there gazing at me at the same time. So we're now we're, we're the three of us are gazing towards each other. But I want to add something else. Sorry, Vincenzo. Uh, Tina and Rosaria also have their hands up. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, I'm sorry. I did, I did, okay. I should be. Go ahead, Rosaria. Right. Yeah. Uh, you have to unmute. Tina, you were first. Your hand went up before me. Please go ahead. You're first. Tina, you go first. Okay, thank you. I, I just thought that these people were lining up to watch a parade, waiting, watching. There was a sense of disappointment or frustration about not really being able to see anything yet maybe, or maybe what they saw was not something that they anticipated. Okay, that's, that's very good. Uh, for me, it, it was, um, I guess, just the sheer emotion expressed. First of all, in the second photograph, you can just see joy, uh, just from the reactions of everyone that's involved. Uh, but the first photo, of course, uh, attracted me more, because even just looking at that couple, the content look of pride on their faces, uh, maybe it could also be, hey, we were first, we got in line, we're up front, we can see everything, uh, you know, and, and the thing is, it's clearly a, a happy occasion, because otherwise it would be sad. They would look frustrated, even if they're posing for the picture. So for me, I just couldn't help but think of them in their minds saying, yeah, we made it first, we're front of the line, so we're, we can see firsthand. But yeah, the emotions are just the main thing that for me, I saw. Uh, anybody else on that, on that photograph? S sorry, what was that? Yeah, anybody else on that oh. photograph? 
Uh, yeah, Jane. Jane. Yeah, I I liked it. I, I again I thought they were in a what waiting waiting for a parade and that the older couple were kind of thinking it used to be better before, but you know, better organized or already here or something. And the the young man, I actually thought he, he's their ride. You know, he's he's the one who's got to bring them to and from and he's standing there about as interested as uh, how many how long now to like get out of here so I, I i i saw the disconnect between them but i gave them a connection by him being uh, their uber driver or something i don't know vincenzo if i may i see tenderness that's the first thing that struck me the tenderness between the the two older people like she's holding she's got her hand on so that's what what i stayed with and and then and then right away the gaze of of the younger man that's trouble i see trouble there uh before we go to photo number two let's anybody else in photo number one I was also going to say, uh, oh, Kelly. Yeah, I saw. Oh, it's okay. Um, yeah, I saw two different reactions to the same thing, d different generational reactions. So for the older couple, my eye was first drawn to them, and I wrote solidarity, family, support, gathering, community. Um, and then for the younger man, I wrote uh, and standing strong. So he's having a different reaction to whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to say that all those my... all those reactions are valid, and they're actually what it's what the photograph gives you, and what and what you give the photograph. You don't really need to know that it was taken in 1973, for example. Well, that's a half a century ago, you know, and uh, you don't really need to know that it was taken at the annual Chin Radio picnic on Central Island in Toronto, and. You know, it's a couple of people said that it was like a parade and it sort of was like a parade, but the standing, because I think that what gives it off the clue of the parade is the, the barricade. Let me go back to the picture. Um, so the barricade um, and is the, um, the clue to the, the fact that it's a parade, but it's actually, it's a show, they're watching a show and, and here's what they're watching. Uh, and maybe I'll read it to you. It's from my book, No Pig With Gold. Um, at the annual Chin Radio picnic on Central Island, an elderly couple and a young man stand behind a barricade. I stand between them and the Miss Bikini contestants who are being paraded on a makeshift stage. I am captivated by their timeless expression. The man rests his arms on the barricade, his left hand drooping over, forefinger extended. His wife does the same. Only the forefinger of her left hand is resting on his shoulder and she leans her head slightly in towards him. She's dressed in black as much for tradition as for making a, for, for marking a period of formal mourning, confirmed also by the black button that her husband wears on his lapel. So there, there's someone in their family died, uh, probably not that long ago, or maybe a couple of years ago. And uh, this is what they, tradition, what they do. Notice the rings on their hands and notice that um, she has, she has her finger on his shoulder or his, you know, his arm. In a way she's saying, and he's really staring at me, right? There's a real strong gaze and with a beautiful smile. He's saying to me, he, she's saying to me, watch it, this guy's mine, I'm protecting mm. <laughs> That's what I saw right, when I was taking the picture. And this man it happens to be there watching the show and then he's fascinated by my camera. So he's, a, he's as much interested in my camera as he was in the show. Um, his, his hair is, tells you, the, the passions tell you the, the whole time period, is the early, early 70s, his floral shirt, you know. Um, and nobody else in the picture is looking at the camera. Isn't that interesting? Not everybody is all over the place, except this. So the camera, in a sense, interferes in, the, in, the, in that setup. I went in there with my camera and I, I created a relation, I, you know, developed some kind of a rapport with them and they responded. And I have to say that these people, uh, just as a little side story, and I have to be careful that I don't go run over time here. So I'll, I'll leave that up to you, uh, Maria or Alicia, uh, as we go along. But when I made this picture, I didn't know who these couple were. 
picture was published on the cover of my book. Um, and many years later, I get a phone call from a family member and they invited me to a big family reunion. Uh, people came from all over the United States, Pittsburgh and other places in the States and Canada. And we met in Scarborough, Ontario in a park and they had a cake with a picture on the cake. They were so proud and they bought 50 copies of the book and every single family member got a copy. But the, old, the elderly couple by then had passed away. And, and that young man, I, I, then I, I confirmed, was not a relative. He just was a bystander, which is also kind of interesting. So that's, that's the, there's no way you would know that, but the, I think what's important is the picture evokes an emotion and evokes a, a sense of timelessness uh, in you. But then you can read the photograph and you can say, look at, look at the way their hands, her hands are beautiful, resting on the, uh, on, the, on, on, the bear, on the on the banister there, and so are his. And I think the hands are such important, hands are, and eyes are what are very important, I think, in portraits. Let's go to the second photograph. Um, and I, maybe I'll leave it on the screen. Maybe we can, it's, it's probably easier if we leave it on the screen. Who has a comment about the second photograph? I think someone has mentioned, uh, was it Rosaya who said it's, it exudes joy? Uh, yes, it, for me, it was just joy was, was what came for me, was the, the over, the encompassing emotion. They were all encompassing. <clears throat> Yeah, I would second that as well. Just very playful, friendly, smiling faces. Also the fact that there are different generations represented here, different ages. Um, and I was also going to say between the first and second photos, the second is color, the first is black and white. So I just immediately assumed that the photo two was maybe more recent in the past five or 10 years versus photo one was much older. So it's, it's the photo of number two is about 10 years old. And um, uh, the movement, it's more, there's movement in the, in the second one. Uh, and that's why initially my eye went to that one uh, because of the movement, the joyful atmosphere. Yes. And, and there's uh, movement within themselves in their own story. They're telling their own story and I'm kind of a witness. Whereas the other picture, I am part of the story. They're, they're telling their story to me um, and, and they're, they're reacting to my camera in a certain way. Here, they know I'm there because you know, they, they knew I was there and there was an intent behind this photograph. Before I go any further, anybody else have a comment on this one? Well, the, the intent of the photograph was that I was illustrating a book, I was creating a book on people with intellectual disabilities uh, across Canada. And uh, this particular young woman in the wheelchair, she had some severe dis disabilities. She couldn't walk and, and couldn't speak and so on. And um, um, she was interested in dancing, in dances. So this, they recreated a dance in the middle of a kind of a forest floor. It was a large park in Scarborough uh, near an oak tree. and um, and. This is the woman who's pushing the wheelchair is the one who helps to look after her and the other um, two are friends with a newborn child. So how do you photograph a dance in a wheelchair? And, and to me, it was an, an incredible um, sort of, I felt humbled by doing this book, which was called, by the way, Invisible No More, because uh, it was a transformative experience in taking these photographs. And it's one case where I felt the photographs in the book could not convey the depth of emotion that I was feeling. And so then I decided to write and I started to combine text with photographs, not for all of them, but a book for 40 of them. And I often do that in books. I, I usually combine, not usually, but quite often I combine photographs and text. And so maybe I'll read, I'll read to you what I wrote about this photograph, which is very short. And actually I have it in the next slide. Um, I have so many things on my desk. All right. Have it not moving. Oak tree. Yes, I remember how we fantasized. If that wizened old oak tree by the Rouge River could talk, 
would it tell of the time when Yunji and, her, and Rebecca and Anna and her infant child, Christian, danced under its November embrace? How the wheelchair was slowed by the soft mantle of decayed leaves that were being slowly absorbed into the earth. That's really, I was trying to convey what I felt. And in a sense for me, what I felt at that moment was captured more in the words in, my, in this case than in the photograph. And so the photograph had an intent um, and yeah, I think that's all I should say about it. And we should go on to, we should go on to the next, uh, next uh, slide. Photo number three and photo number four. Um, no, they're both black and white and we can talk about black and white in color later on and near the end because it's a very unusual long discussion usually. We'll save that for the end. A minute has passed by. So, photo number three. Um, who wants to go with some comments? Uh, well, the first word I thought of when I saw both, but three, I'll talk about three, is repose, like some sort of break in time almost in photo three. They look like they maybe just finished a shift. Maybe it's lunchtime, so they're in the middle of some kind of work. And it, and they're both, they, they all look very relaxed in the picture around the table with presumably food and drinks. They're all facing us very open. Their chests and faces and eyes are looking at the lens, except for the one on the left whose eyes aren't looking at the camera and his body, his posture is, is not facing the camera either. So there's a little bit of a break in that pattern as well. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, if I share a screen, I can't see your faces. So I wonder, I guess maybe if I put it on, I don't see a few for some reason. Um, Anybody else about this picture? What you said is um, um, all, all, all very accurate, actually. It is a break in their, in their work schedule. Uh, I think, uh, Rosaria? Yes, thank you. Um, well, I, I don't know if I would call it a rest per se, um, it's uh, for me, the thing that comes to mind is hard days work. Um, and clearly they're probably not in the best conditions, uh, in which they're working because there's a lot of darkness and I know it's black and white, but still, it just seems like it's really, really dark. The floor doesn't look clean. Um, it doesn't necessarily look like a happy lunchroom as one would normally think. Um, and you know, even looking at the way they're dressed they they look very tired and their clothing is very dirty from their shoes to everything else. Um, and, you know, if they were happy, they would smile. Maybe they don't even want to be recognized. I'm not sure, but there's just something about this photograph that has a bit of a negative attribute to it. They actually look weary, don't they? I would agree, yeah. yeah. Well, um, this photograph goes back to 1984 and it's a picture of Mexican farm workers working in Ontario. These are guest farm workers who come to Ontario to work and to the rest of Canada 
uh, every year on a temporary basis. So they can't stay here. They're not, they're not landed immigrants. They come to work and then they go back year after year after year. Um, what, I, what I like about the picture is that this picture, again, I took it as a part of a documentation of migrant workers. Um, so again, I had, I had a certain intent with it because I wanted to illustrate a certain, a certain perspective, a certain point of view. Uh, what they do is very important for us in Canada, but at the same time, what they do uh, means that um, we in Canada rely on uh, a developing country, especially at that time in 1984, uh, to supply our food for us. We can't even really grow our own food because we don't really want to pay people high enough wages for Canadians to do that. So we import people from other countries, and many countries do that. And it's now become a kind of a, a way that a lot of economies operate. But the photograph has a couple of things which would, would, would be kind of, um, would give you the wrong impression. One of them is that they're, they're, they're drinking beer, that they have beer after work. Well, they have beer after work in this case, but the beer got there because I was there. And again, the photographer intervened in their, work, in their, in, in their schedule. I was there. And because they, the, the owner of the farm wanted to impress me with how well he, he treated his workers, he brought them beer that evening. Because then I asked them after he left, do you get beer? Usually they said, no, it's the first time we get beer. So that photograph, again, captures a true representation of reality, what's in front of the camera. But it has a, a twisted meaning in a sense. So it's very important about how to read a photograph. Never believe everything you see in a photograph, even though it appears to be called the truth. What I love about the photograph, though, is that they, they're rising out of the darkness. They come out of that darkness into, in, into the light. They're bathed in light. There's a, there's a ray of, uh, of sunshine that's filtering through the, uh, through the I was going to say through the kitchen, but really it's a converted uh, storage warehouse on a, on, a, on, on, a, on, a, on a tobacco farm. So that's where they were living. There's a fridge there, there's a stove, there's a cement floor. Um, and because it's dark in the background, the background is obscured, but that means that they rise from the darkness into the, in, in, into the light. And again, that is the whole nature of photography is bringing things into light, revealing, they reveal themselves. They're very stoic. Um, I took the picture after a whole day of being on the farm with them, so they trusted me. I was speaking in Spanish with them at that time, very broken Spanish, but they really appreciated that. And so I had made some kind of rapport, connection with them. Um, and one of the people who, who has this picture on their, in, their office, in their office walls said that reminds them sometimes, I have to say humbly, of the work of painters like Caravaggio who are painting in the chiaroscuro effect, right? Because again, as a photographer, as a writer, one gets influenced by everything that you've done, everything that you've read, everything that you've looked at, uh, everything that you've felt goes into your into your writing and so the photograph can have um can have many layers of meaning in this case and here's one one layer of meaning that i um actually what i'll do is i'll uh, um, stop share and read but it was in the book which are not my words in this case oh i'm sorry here's vincenzo getting mixed up again uh, I meant to do this. In 1984, it was a horrible situation for me. The conditions where we lived were terrible, and so was the owner. He treated us worse than animals, you could say. But I continued to work and put up with that for a year. I have pictures of myself looking very skinny for the pressure that we were under. And I put up with it so that I wouldn't lose the opportunity of coming back to Canada to work. Why did I put up with it? For my children, that's why. So I used quotations that I got through in interviews, excerpts. Of course, I chose the excerpt, you know? So photography is not objective. Photography is, very, is, is as objective as the photographer, as the writer. Um, and so I, I'm trying to make a point about, I think it's a terrible situation that we have to rely on hard on migrant workers at the same time, I. I have a lot of respect for them, so I want to photograph them in, in a good way, but I want to convey this, this contradiction. 
and I think and I think so. The statement that I chose was a statement that was I thought fair for this particular farm. Um, if I go back to photo number four now. Yeah, I uh, can I. Uh, uh, of course, you can't help looking at both photos because they're side by side, but both of them uh, re require a little bit extra work in in moving from what stands in the foreground to the back, like the workers sitting at the back. So, and here uh, I was drawn more to photo four because a little child sleeping oh. there. And so while the original uh, attention is to the woman working there, obviously another, another situation like in photo three, it seems, and almost an exploitative type of labor. Uh, but on top of that, you have all the, uh, all the problems that come along with, uh, with motherhood and having to deal with it. How do you, how do you juggle uh, such a situation with having children and ca caring for them? Um, I don't know if this is in Canada or elsewhere, but uh, once you see the child sleeping there, I think that becomes more the focus. It shifts the focus somewhat, the balance in a very positive way, I think. Yeah, th thank you, Pasquale. That's, that's, that's a, a, I think, a very close account. Um, any other impressions that anybody else had? Yes. Um unlike photo three, where the people are brighter than the background, because the background is very dark. In photo four, the background is light and it's the woman in the foreground that's very dark. And so that immediately captures your, your attention or your gaze. Um, and um, like, um, uh, sorry, I don't remember your name. The man who just spoke, um, he mentioned how you're uh, sort of drawn or redirected to the boy sleeping. Um, it's sort of, he captures your attention, he redirects it, even though his eyes are closed and hers are facing us. So there's an interesting sort of contrast there as well in terms of the stare, but also the color. Um, and I would also say too, in talking about hands in the last two photos and movement, her eyes are looking at us, but her hands don't seem to break from the work she's doing, which is really interesting. So it's like, even though she's, maybe caught a bit off guard from a camera lens that's being pointed at her. Her hands don't seem to be stopping what she's doing. Thank you. Um, I found it interesting think, that, uh, that you have, sorry, uh, found it interesting that you have this raft of beautiful flowers, but they're portrayed in black and white and it's kind of in a way we're robbed a little bit because we can't enjoy the the true beauty of, of the flowers. However, we can enjoy the true beauty of the uh, cigarettes at the back of the of the photo just above the sleeping child. <laughs> Another interesting contrast of yes. ideas. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a real contrast between between nature and smoking, you know, and the cigarettes, yeah. uh, which are killers and which and and with nature, which is really life-sustaining and sustainer of beauty. Yeah. And she's working in between these two poles. I think, I'm not sure who had, their, who had their hands up. I think Kelly, I saw on the screen before. Oh, okay. Thank you, Vincent. So powerful. Um, I orig originally written about the first one, but the fourth one, just looking at it now, what strikes me is there are these different precious bundles there are the flowers that are a precious bundle and they're sold commercially and there's value put on them because they bring in money but the most precious bundle is the child lying sleeping behind her and the fact that the child is behind her and she has to have her back to the child just um for me it speaks a lot about about some of the struggles of working motherhood yes absolutely that's exactly what, what i felt when i when i made this picture um, yeah. Um, and in the, the photo three, if if may. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I feel like my connection is a bit unstable. Can everybody hear me okay? Uh, I can hear you. I don't know if anybody else can. 
you. Okay, thank you. And, and for photo three, I just, my eye keeps being drawn to the feet and the ankles. And I find that very powerful as well. There's something very intimate about seeing somebody's ankles or somebody's feet. And um, when you mentioned before that the men trusted you, that makes sense to me now that, that they're not hiding different parts of their, their bodies. They're just open and showing themselves. Yes. I think, I think building trust and rapport is extremely important uh, in making these kinds of photographs. Mm -hmm. For me, anyways, that's how I work. Uh, I think I saw two more participants who had their hands up, but I'm not sure who they were now. Just go ahead and unmute yourself and say, and Okay, I think I was next, if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> um, just quickly, Vincenzo, I'm always interested to see how, like what you include in the photograph, um, in the sense where photo three, you're standing back a bit, obviously, because it's a big group, but in photo four, we don't really have an idea about the space in which she's working in. Um, the fact that the child will be sleeping behind her, I'm assuming is a very small workspace, so she can't really put her child in another room. Um, and so even the fact that, you know, you, you've uh, only captured just on the left, we only see part of that stack of items. Um, you know, obviously, I guess your main focus was the child and mother, but yeah. it would have been an interesting, like, as to why you chose not to show the entire span of the room. Like, did that ever, would you, was that something that you've often thought about? No, actually, I hadn't um, thought about that because I thought the rest of the room was a, you know, it's obviously a store because she's working at a counter and she's selling cigarettes and she's selling flowers. So uh, it's a flower shop. And I thought, what a contrast between the, the flowers and the cigarettes. And if you, in terms of clues as to where it was taken, if one were to enlarge this picture and research it, there's a clue that the cigarettes are Canadian cigarettes. So it had to be taken somewhere in Canada. In fact, it was taken in Toronto. Um, but then as I, as I was, I was buying flowers. I went in to buy flowers and I, parked my car uh, illegally, like quickly down the street, you know, in front of the store. And I went to buy flowers and I, and I saw the child. It took me a few seconds to see the child because I was concentrating on, my, on, 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 the, on the flowers. Mm -hmm. and when I saw the child, my, I, I sort of, I, my, I, I skipped, you know, my heart skipped a beat. And I said, um, uh, just a minute, I'll be right back. And I ran to my car, got my camera, ran back into the store and said, may I take a picture of you with your child? And she said, yes. And, and I took a picture. So um, I think for me, the picture encapsulates a whole story of immigration. It's a story of immigration. Um, it's a story of uh, working class and survival. It's a story of um, mothers and motherhood and children and daycare or the lack of daycare, for example. All those issues which come, it's a, it's a picture of human rights. In the end, so all those things. When I when I take the picture, I'm not saying that I think of all those things, but some of those things certainly come into my mind, and they trigger the photograph. And then when I look at the photograph later, and then I see additional things. Often, the, uh, that's often the case. So sometimes you have only a, an opportunity. I don't want to pester her with, for you know, with lots of pictures. I just want to take one or two shots. In fact, I think I think I think I took maybe about three shots. These are all, by the way, with film. So it's, a, it's very mechanical. You have to manually advance the film, click, advance the film, click again, right? And also before any other customer came in and then would have interrupted my, my sort of uh, sequence with, with her. So I didn't, think that, I didn't take pictures of the rest of the store because the rest of the store was, um, didn't relate to that moment. I wanted to convey a mother with a, a working mother with unbelievable conditions that she has to bring her child to work and can't even put the child in a proper bed at work. She puts the child in a, uh, the child was in kind of in a box, you know, behind the counter. In a way, she's close to the child, but in, a, in, a, in another way, someone pointed out that she's got her back to the child. And that's also very poignant. So you see all the different layers that, that the picture can have. We, we identify about three or four themes right here, like immigration, working class, um, mother and child, daycare, uh, environment, cigarettes, smoking, you know, um, and it's black and white. And um, I think for me, black and white zeroes in to the essence of the, of, of the uh, point that I want to make. If it was color, your, your eyes would have gone to the flowers. 
because they're beautiful, you know. <laughs> and it was and and the cigarettes were also been very colored. They're red and green and blue. Um, but I wanted really to uh, your your focus to be on that woman's face. And then after a couple of seconds, you see, oh, there's a, she's got a child there. So, Vincenzo, sorry, what year was this taken? 1989. Okay. See, I, I, I always have a camera with me because sometimes this was a totally unplanned picture. Uh, you never know. Photography for me is, is something that happens, it's part of life, it happens every day. And so, you never know when, you know, you never know when you're going to meet a photograph, as it were, have a photographic encounter. I don't post people, I don't say, I didn't say to her, Put your hands there and do this and do that. I just say, please look at my camera. And I think when you look at the camera, if you're kind of, if you're playing games with them, people know, and they'll and they'll hold back. But if they trust you, then the rest is they're giving you a photograph. I like to say that a great mm -hmm. portrait in photography is given, and not taken, because it's actually a collaboration between the person in front of the camera and the person behind the camera. And then the stories come later, the actual written stories. I was just going to ask, sorry to ask another question, but do you always ask the subjects of your photos uh, if you can take their picture? Um, not always, because sometimes the situation doesn't permit it. Mm -hmm. And and I'll, I'll and that's a, you asked that question at a very good moment. <laughs> because. Uh, okay. um, Vince, I think Tina had uh, oh, okay. wanted to comment. Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't see your hands here because uh, okay. I only get six little screens. I don't even get all the screens. So I rely on Lydia and Alicia and uh, Maria Pia, okay, for, for that. So, so uh, Tina? I, I'm sorry. I, um, I was just gonna say, I really, really love these two pictures and the way they were positioned together because it shows the kinds of sacrifices that parents or people have in order to make a living um, and the kinds of conditions that they are willing to put themselves under. Mm. Um, the, um, the vulnerability of this beautiful woman um, uh, selling flowers um, together with cigarettes. It's sort of like things that we don't consider um, that essential. They're not for food. They're not for but they're essential because of their beauty. And, the, and she's a beautiful woman herself and she has a child um, with her. And the bundles that, that are um, showing um, that are tied up there are sort of like somebody mentioned earlier, bundles of, of, of what we carry and what we bring forward. So it's a, the, the setting photo three and photo four together is really excellent because it uh, talks about the, um, the kinds of sacrifices that, that people have to make in order just to make a living. They're you know, just to make a living, absolutely. Uh, these people on the left have come all the way from Mexico um, every year and they come for 20, 30 years. So they, and they stay up to six months. And that happens in California, that happens in Italy, that happens in, that happens in Mexico with Guatemalans, for example, going to Mexico. It happens in the Dominican Republic with Haitians going across the border. It's like growing food is, has been relegated as a, as a cheap job, you see? And so it's, these are stories about immigration, basically. One little point about the woman with the flowers and the child. Notice her hand, her, 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 her finger, she has a little, what's it called, a thimble? Because she's, she's, um, she's using that, I think, to help her pick up the wrapping to wrap the flowers. That means that when she has to handle her child, she has to remove that thimble first or the child gets, doesn't really get to feel the skin of the finger. So it's another impediment, another. And so we went through that. Photo, how are we doing on time, um, Licia? Yeah, it's uh, 2.56, so you have about. Okay, we're we're, we're, we're yeah. good. We'll, yeah, we'll okay. Try and wrap up by, by 3.15 and leave 15 minutes for a general sort of discussion. Yeah, and we did start five minutes late, so yeah, okay. let's take an extra five minutes. So we're, we're doing well. So photo number five and photo number six. How many people think there's a relationship between the couple and the older woman? 
Okay, well, quite a few people. We don't really know that though, right? But Tina, I think you have your hand raised. Or... Well, I don't know whether there was a relationship, but I thought that she looked like she was either the seamstress that did the did the dress or the, the you know, basically saying, hey, look what I just did here. <laughs> But that's the way the, the message was. But maybe she didn't have anything to do at all with the picture. I just, I just kind of wondered whether that was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she, she didn't. It's one of those cases where the photographer looks at what's in front of the camera, and I positioned my camera in a way to capture her with a couple. The couple themselves were being photographed by their official wedding photographer. And before I go any further, any, any, does anybody else have their hand up? Because I really can't see you if you have your hand up. So I can't see all the screens. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'll just jump in and say something quickly. Yeah. I couldn't help but think that this is probably a public place and there probably are other people there. Yeah. And you know, people are always, I'm assuming this is in Italy, uh, or somewhere in Europe, and people are always fascinated to see the new bride or the bride. And so maybe this lady wanted a closer look. Because um, I, I don't know, maybe it's a fashion faux pas, but I look at the way she's dressed, and I'm thinking, I don't know if she would wear those shoes uh, <laughs> to the wedding. She, you know, and her hair doesn't seem that um that coy, you know, coiffed uh, well enough for a wedding. So that's that's the big that's what I was thinking. She's not wearing stockings either. I, thank you. There you go. I didn't even notice that. <laughs> Shame on me. And you I see, any, yes, um, interesting observations. A anybody else? I don't think the bride's wearing stockings either under that dress. Probably very <laughs> hot. It was a it was a very hot day. That's true. Um, when I look at the picture, the older woman, she is solidly turning her back on their so-called in quotes future of beauty and light is what I picked up out of that. <laughs> She's going, done that, been there, I'm over here. She's moving away. Well, is someone taking a picture of her from the other side with the bride and groom? Is that what's going on? Is there someone taking a photograph of the older no, no one is. She, someone's taking a photograph of the of the bride and groom. Okay, but not she, from. She's being posed in a certain way, yeah. which is also interesting, and she's just kind of part of the scenery. She, it's a public. It's a it's a small piazza. It's in Calabria, in Italy. It's in Pizzo, the city of Pizzo, Pizzo Calabro, and it overlooks a huge sort of a, a cliff. Uh, there's a castle behind them. And there's a cliff that goes to the sea. So most people go to the edge of, of that piazza. It's like a balcony, it's a beautiful piazza. Most people go to the edge to look at the ocean, to look at the Mediterranean Sea. And, and so it was sunset. You can see that from the light on the bride's face. And what I like about it is the fact that photography has a way of imposing certain visions on, our, on us. And it's a very important point that I really want to underscore. In this case, they're being posed by the professional photographer, a wedding photographer. And I you know at one point I used to be a wedding photographer, you know, myself. Um, and the wedding photographer says, no, you put, put, he said, put your, put your hand in her hair. I mean, I was there, I witnessed the whole thing. And so he put her hand on, on, on her hair. And in a way, this is the, it's the man sort of caressing the woman or touching the woman, which is what we often see we don't see the other the other side of the picture. We don't see the, the woman caressing the man's. I mean, sometimes we do, but usually the, that's the image of the bride. She's looking very demurely down, you know, um, and that kind of thing. So I think that in a sense, it informs us. It certainly informs a lot of brides that way because I'm trying to make a, you know, a, a statement. And, and the picture eventually um, was seen by a good friend and writer, Mark Kretzkin. And he wrote a beautiful piece on it, which we eventually published in a book called um, where angels come to earth. That's because it happened to be in a piazza um, 
and it shows the extent of daily life in the piazza, you know. So maybe what I'll do now is I'll read what Mark wrote because it's quite a beautiful piece. Um, and of course, you know, I should have it right here. Yes. A young bride in white on the far left and an old woman dressed all in black on the far right bookend the two sides of this photo. The verticals in the photo, the three standing figures, including the groom, are connected by several strong horizontals. An iron pipe along the stone wall in the background, the top railing of the steel fence along the piazza's edge, and the bride's long white train. The train, foam of wave upon wave, connects the two women in the photo. The bride next to her groom looks down, imagining her future. The old woman, all in black but with white hair, looks away in the opposite direction toward the past. The viewer can imagine that the old woman is a bride many years down the road. This photo manages to capture in a single moment truth about the, in, in el, 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 I can never pronounce that word, the uh, in a, in a look, look table, sorry, passage of time. Um, I think the way Mark saw the picture is amazing because he wasn't aware of how I took the pictures. So when I write about my pictures, I'm also aware why I took them. It's very different. Well, his picture is completely out of context, this picture for him. And this is what he saw. He saw these two women reflecting on their lives. One is at the end of her life. One is, the, in a sense, the beginning of her life. Um, but you see how it can be a little bit, like if I had taken the picture with other woman, um, with the old woman, it would be a, a whole different ball game altogether. No, no relationship. So in a sense, I created the relationship between them in the, in, in the photograph. So again, the, the photography is not at all objective. Um, Sorry, Vince, I, I'm wondering if Kelly had uh, a comment. Kelly, you had your hand up earlier. Oh, thank you, Alicia. Yeah, um, I, I would... I love photo five and I just found that there's such a freedom in the old woman's stance and I like it because it's surprising like one would expect her to maybe be sad and looking back um, with regret that those days are over but I almost see her looking towards a different kind of future she's stepping away from the bride's train there's something about her body language to me that says I'm free of all that and it, it can seem like a celebration of old age yeah, she might be saying, I've been there, done that. You know, I mean, yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Um, and let's go to photo number six, just to move on, keep moving along. Nobody wants to go? Well, I can tell you this picture was taken in a park, in a public park, and I was photographing the entire park, and I have been there all day long. Uh, this is for a magazine article, Dufferin Grove Park in Toronto. And um, it's hard to go in a park and take a picture of someone unless you interact with them. I guess it's their, it's their you know, like with a wedding couple in a way, because there was another photographer there and because it's a wedding couple, it's a piazza, people don't seem to mind as much. You know, you know you're kind of not really intruding in their space. You're not, I'm also very careful how I use my pictures because I think the photographer has a, a remarkable deep responsibility they carry on their shoulders uh, in terms of how the pictures are, are, are used. And we can talk about that and make a little bit later and make a note, the usage of pictures. Um, but this one here, um, in the park, which was a, there were a lot of acti activities going on in that park that day. And I was attracted by the, by the, uh, the woman with these two uh, younger girls. And um, she, I'm not sure if she was her mother, uh, but she, she might've been uh, a relative. She was certainly a relative. Um, and they were using a singer sewing machine. And I felt the singer sewing machine is one of the most internationally recognized symbols, you know, in the 20th century anyways. 
because uh, you have singer sewing machines in virtually every country where you where you go. So it's like a it's like a standard. It's like a, a constant. And I thought here's in the middle of Toronto, and Toronto looks like this. Toronto looks like the like like the people in this picture, you know. Um, there's a large uh, Muslim culture, for example, in, in, uh, in uh, population in the city. And of course, this was in the 1990s, it was even less. So I approached them and I said, may I take some pictures while you're doing this? And you, she was doing a, a kind of, a, she was doing a, sort of a workshop on, on sewing. And she was showing how to sew to a number, of, a number of kids. And these two kids were hovering around her. So I felt there was a, a special relationship with, with them. The, the, the child, the little girl on the right, she's kind of uh, uneasy a little bit, right? She's wondering, what's this guy up to? What, what's, you know, and she's, you know, she's, she hasn't moved away because again, the camera is an, 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 a very fascinating instrument for people. It's like, it's like bees to honey. Uh, maybe not so much today because today we have cell phones and everybody has a cell phone. So the aura of the camera has sort of disappeared. But it used to be that when you showed up in a place with a camera, I would take pictures in, uh, in factories and people say, hey, how about me? Don't I count? You know, take a picture of me. It's like camera conveys a sort of validity, um, the way we've, um, you know, we let our camera culture develop. So people say, uh, take a picture of me and they, and they post right away. Workers will say to me, uh, take a picture of me and I'll pretend I'm working. And they'll pick up a hammer and hold the hammer pretending they're working. But I said, well, if you're gonna be, I wanna take a picture of you as you're, as you're working, because if you're very good at pretending, your work would be that of an actor, not that of a mechanic or whatever it was that I was photographing. So in this case, it was just one of those moments that comes your way sometimes. Um, and it was used in a magazine article to talk about the uh, reclaiming of the park by the local population from um, right, uh, basically from drug gangs at that time. In, in, that, in, in that neighborhood. So again, there was intent, but you would never know that, right? And I think I wanna finish the talk with these two photographs because these two photographs are, I mean, the clues on the num number eight, they're about the family album. And we all have family albums. So I'll let you look at them for a minute and then we'll talk about them. Minutes pass by. Okay. Any guesses on number seven, what it might be a picture of? Or what it might reveal? Given our discussion that we've had about what things don't appear to be always, but not what they appear to be sometimes there. Are you on picture number eight? No, number seven. <laughs> I was going to do number seven first. Oh, is, am I in picture number eight? Let's, let's do number seven first, and then. Well, I assumed it was a mother and son, but if you know, 
that's an assumption just based on what's in the photo, but now then we're thinking about uh, images may not capture what is real, right? Or what we may not assume it could be something different. Well, I think um, the empty space on the left is normally, you know, left for the father figure or the husband, mm -hmm. let's say. And in this case, the husband is away. The husband is away in Canada working. And this is in the family album because um, when I photographed the migrant workers, I went back to the same village. I went to Mexico to photograph some of them um, in their own village in, you know, in Mexico, a couple of villages and in Jamaica also. And I gave them photographs. And uh, of course those photographs are very valuable to them because they don't have cameras. And they never saw what their, what their fathers, their brothers, their husbands, because it was mostly men who come to, to Canada did when they came to Canada. They not had they had pictures. And these pictures went to the family album. So I thought I would use it as a family album picture because the absence, the, the empty space refers to an absence in their lives. It's a metaphor for their the absence of the, the father. And she and she she talks about that. She talks about I interviewed them etc. Et um, and because we were running short on time, I had some text with her but maybe I can do it very quickly and, and just read it. Um, tell me it doesn't always do that. Some of the men return home and they're different. They're more, they're more responsible family men. Maybe it's because they also suffer up there. Just like my brother, before going up, going up to Canada, there's a word missing, he didn't really like to go to work. Not anymore. Since going to Canada, my brother is a different guy has even stopped crying about things. And this is, was told me by the wife of a migrant worker who first stays, in, stays back home. And the family album, photo number, number eight, any comments on that one? Well, no one is smiling. So that's maybe telling them something. No one is smiling. They're like, <laughs> So stiff, right? These people are obviously not used to having their picture taken. Um, their clothes look a little bit, they don't really fit that well, you know? Uh, but there's relationships that you can build. Uh, it's a family picture and it's my family. And I'm in the picture. Um, I'm the cute one. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm the one on the left here. Um, and I'm holding my sister's hand because she's younger than me. So we were told, you know, get a hold of her hand. You're gonna look after your sister. And then my father has his hand on my mother's shoulder, just like the the first picture that that, that I showed you of the elderly couple. She has her hand on his on his shoulder, right? The the guys are all wearing a tie, and um, uh, it, this is the first family portrait that we ever had. Oh, something happened. The first family portrait that we ever had, um, and it was in Canada. We had just arrived in Canada, and the first one of the first things that my father did, he took us to Photocola, the, the name and the number is there on the photograph, to have a family, which is what people did, because there were very few pictures. People didn't have cameras. Now I noticed that my two brothers are both wearing a pen and and their in, in their jackets, right? And sure enough, they became, you know, uh, they became teachers and writers and so on. Um, in, in a way that, in, in a way, the pen, you know, was befitting. Um, so I kind of, I look, I look for these things, and of course, the photographer is the one who, who uh, positions us there. So people are positioned according to, to age. So the, you know, my oldest brother, my oldest brother is the one with the glasses. He's next to my father. First one in line for the throne, right? And uh, the other brother, Domenico, is uh, next to him. His, the three buttons of his jacket are like really stiffly put on. These are people who, of course, only a couple of months earlier, never even had these suits. And they come to America, to Canada, and now they have a suit, they have a photograph, and this picture was displayed in, you know, in, in our house for, you know, it's, it's actually still in my house. But I want, I want to finish with these pictures because I think the family album is something that's disappearing from our lives. 
and it's something that's so important because people now take a million pictures with their cell phone, but they never make prints. So the pictures don't really exist. They exist only ephemerally. So I want to under underscore that the importance of maintaining a family album and, and, uh, and going through the efforts of, of, of choosing your pictures and because they're going to be lost, right? Um, so can we talk about the main points that came out in, the, in, in this discussion? Uh, I made some notes. I mean, things like, um, Some pictures reveal things that we thought weren't there at the beginning, like the, the picture of the, uh, the woman with the child in the, in the store. Uh, the relationship of the man, the, the old couple, and, and the uh, relationships that we think might be there, might not be there. Same with the, with the, with the bridal uh, couple. Um, the, the idea of bathing someone in light, even this woman here on the left of the screen and, and her son, are bathed in light by the window, by window light. By the way, I don't, re I don't use flash for my pictures. I just look for, for natural light. Natural light is the best light you can have. And windows are some of the best, probably some of the best light ever. So if, you if you're gonna make a portrait, um, you put your back to the window and your subject goes facing the window and you, and you get this fantastic light all the time. Um, if there's no light, there's no photo art. So therefore, that's why people bring in flash because to illuminate dark places when there is no light. I try and photograph dark places with every, any way I can. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes you can't, but usually there's a ways, ways you can do that with, with film and especially with digital today. I want to talk about color in black and white. I mean, the main issue that came up, I think. And for me, color in black and white are like two different languages. When I'm photographing in black and white, I'm thinking a certain way. I'm not thinking of the color at all. I'm not, I'm not even looking at the color. The color gets in my way, so I try and avoid it. Uh, someone is wearing a red robe and say, oh my God, it's so red. It's gonna, you know, it's gonna kill the expression on their face. And what I'm interested in is the, is the expression on their face. And when I, when I photograph in color, then I look for color. So, because again, then my, my mind psychologically goes into a different, a different form. And sometimes you make a mistake. And with digital photography, you can correct that. Because you take a picture in color with pixels. People say, do you use color or black and white? I say, well, I use pixels. And, and then you can convert those pixels into black and white or into color. Um, and, but, but normally in the, in the older days, before digital, I would have two cameras working at the same time. And at the end of a session, like photographing a procession or photographing some farm workers, um, I would get a headache from thinking one camera is my color camera, one camera is my black and white camera. It was just too much of a conflict in my, in my mind, in my brain. But they are like two completely different languages. I think that black and white is the, for me, takes more of the essence of, of, the, uh, of, the, of, of, of the moment. And I'm trying to capture a moment that lives on in a sense. The other thing that we didn't talk about, I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that. Because I know today the world is color because our cameras are pre-programmed for color, but you can also pre-program your camera for black and white. So think, try it sometime. You might reveal something new. And I think in terms of stories, the stories are in your mind already and your interpretation of the photograph, like John Berger said, your interpretation of the photograph is that you are conveying a story about that photograph yourself. You're bringing your own stories into the photograph and the photograph helps you, you know, kind of bring them to, to fruition, to reveal them. That's how I see it, as a sources of inspiration. So the, 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 here are two families, one broken by immigration on the left, one reunited by immigration, because we were in Italy, my father was in Canada. So we were reunited, you know, um, so that's two stories right there. What's our time like? 320. Yeah, so we have 15, a, 15 minutes or so. Yeah. Yeah, we can go till 335 or, yeah. Just some questions for you to ponder.
And here's the, um, the film that I mentioned earlier by Fred Scapizzi or Schapizzi, um, Words and Pictures. And it's not about photography, it's about paintings in this case. But the discussion about words and pictures is riveting in this film. So what I'll do is I'll uh, stop sharing screen. And um, I'll see if I can figure out a way of putting that on the chat. So any questions uh, so far? Don't be, don't, don't, don't be shy. Can I share a, a photograph with you? Yeah. <laughs> by, no, by no means as a photographer, but uh, just as something that, uh, uh, especially after seeing those last uh, two, uh, it's a photograph that I took uh, at the airport in, in Naples as we were about to leave for Canada. And so it's a photograph, the last photograph of a lot of people who passed away and then we never saw again. And uh, you will see that it's uh, by no means a, a photographer's photograph. I took it with my plastic Diana. I was 11 years old and somebody had given me that. Uh, and, I'll, uh, and I wrote a whole chapter on it in, in one of my uh, books. As you see, it's, uh, you can see that. It's completely out of focus. And unless you actually know the people in it, uh, they're unrecognizable, but, uh, it's a photograph that I still have, you know, in the little square format that they used to be. And it's one of my most prized possessions because of that, you know. So the power of, of photography is just incredible. But, and I hope that it's the same nowadays, even though, even though uh, there's so many photos floating around and everyone takes lots of uh, selfies and, Photographs, as you said, that are never printed and they just sort of sit inside a telephone and, and exist our somewhere. Are, our lives are inside these telephones. Yeah. You know, on, on, the, on the cloud. I think that we think about a photograph, it's just a, a, sm a small fraction of a second, like really a hundredth of a second. Think of a second of time. It goes, bop, you know, 1001, 1002. That's how we used to count in the dark room. We I mean, would say if your timer broke. So it's actually, this is a photo is usually about a small fraction, like one hundredth or one fiftieth of a second. So we, we can't even imagine it. And yet, if it's the right fraction of a second, it's forever. It's timeless. And there's a book by French photographer Robert Doineau called Three Seconds from Eternity. And the, the title of his book comes from the fact that all the pictures in his book when he added them up all together, amount to roughly three seconds of time that he snatched from eternity, he said. I think it's a beautiful title. Because all the pictures that I showed you are just a small fraction. What's his name? Sorry, can you repeat? Uh, Robert Duano. Duano. Oh, okay, Duano. yeah. Okay. And three seconds from eternity. And I, and I, I managed to um, paste the... Um, the words and pictures film on the on on the chat along with my uh, website can you can you try it again please Vince? because the link is broken um i think there's a space between the i and the d oh okay okay but i should tell you that um you can find this film okay on, on canopy so if you go on Canopy, I don't know if you know about Canopy. Oh, Canopy there it is. Okay. You need a you need a library card basically to go to Canopy, and, and then the film is free. So you go to Canopy, 
and you search words and pictures and you get the film. I think no matter where you live, as long as you have a, a, a library card from your, from your municipality. Okay, the link works. Works, okay, great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I have a, a question. I'm curious to know if uh, you take pictures with your phone. Well, I know you do, but I mean, do you take a photographer's photo with your phone? And if you've ever used any of those taken with your phone in, in a book or you know something professional? Not yet. I mean, I, I do take pictures with my phone as a as a dire in dire circumstances if I don't have my camera with me. And I have to say that the phone is so sophisticated these days that it allows you to take pictures in places where large cameras can't do it because large cameras don't have lenses that are as, as wide and as, as open. A telephone, uh, you can, it focuses instantly. The only problem with a telephone is that the resolution isn't all that large. It's okay, it's fantastic for looking at stuff on the screen. And when you go try and go make prints, you can make a print, you can make an eight by 10 print. But if you're trying to make a fine art print, an exhibition type print, like large, such as you see, you see, you see on my wall and behind there, I don't know if you can see it, um, it's too dark, but that's like 40, 30 by 40 print. Uh, with a phone, you can't do that. So the phone is in a way, it conditions people to take pictures just for the computer. Um, but you, you, you can make eight by tens, you know, and, uh, and they're not bad at all. And the phone is a, it's a piece of technology and, and technology can't be stopped. In fact, there's the manufacturers of cameras, the 35 millimeter single lens reflex cameras are no longer gonna manufacture them because so few people buy them. But I was at an event recently um, where um, I was the only one with a camera. And there was a professional photographer there and there was me who was taking pictures, not professionally, just for myself. And everybody else was taking pictures of the phone. And virtually everyone in the gathering was taking pictures. You know, I went to a Leonard Cohen concert one time in Toronto, and it's like no one was listening to a concert, everybody was with their phone. And, and I know that when I, when I raise my camera to take a picture, I concentrate so much on the picture that I lose a sense of what's around me. In that split second, you're, there's a communion with the, with, with, with the, you know, with the, with the photograph. And you know, sometimes, I think sometimes the, the best pictures are the ones you don't, you haven't taken, because you, you couldn't liberate yourself from that moment. I, I'll give you an example. My father and I were one time working, many years ago, demolishing an old garage, and we were both working, and I had a camera with me in a plastic bag because it was so dusty. And then we were, we stopped for lunch, and we were having lunch, together. And I thought this would make a great shot. But if I take the picture, it's not the shot that I want. So I, I didn't take that picture. You know, so, um, so somebody else could have taken it if they were around. Uh, and, today with, and today with a cell phone, of course. Um, but I think that what worries me is that people believe pictures and we, don't, and we have a very low level of visual literacy. And visual literacy ought to be taught in schools the same way as the alphabet. What, what, what does a picture mean? Why is it there? Who put it there? Did um, Corporation X put it there so you can buy their product? Did Political Party X put it there so you can vote for them? You know, there's a, every picture that's there, when you look at a newspaper, the front page is there because someone decided this picture is gonna be this big at this spot on the top of the page. It's not gonna be on page three, it's gonna be page one. So these are all conscious decisions that someone makes. Um, so I, th I think we need to learn that as a society because we're being, um, you know, totally brainwashed. Um, how the news is reported. So the more technology we have, the smarter we have to be over the technology. But what's happening is the more technology we have, we are dumbing down as a, as a society and we let the technology take over. That, that worries me a lot. So I try not to show my granddaughter that I'm playing with my phone all the time. It's really hard. God, is it, is it hard? Because the telephone is, is, is you know, is your everything, your, is your watch, is your everything, right? And it's not just the phone. Um, but yeah, so, so I think the credibility of the photograph is at stake. We can't tell if that's not, the word documentary photography 
it's a document. I, like Pascual, you took a picture of the, of the departure from Naples, which is where I also departed from. Uh, we don't have a picture. <laughs> it was a document of the moment, right? It's documentary evidence that you actually were there on that, you know, or your family was there on that pier, uh, even though it's, you know, out of focus, etc. Today, I couldn't manufacture a picture like that with Photoshop. So we're manufacturing truth. It's like manufacturing consent, you know? It's manufacturing truth. And I think the wedding that I saw a couple of days ago in Woodbridge, I believe that they were, uh, I don't want to mention names, but it, it, the exercise seemed to be the, an attempt to manufacture certain kinds of meanings in life, you know? Like the more photos you have, is it more meaningful or less meaningful? Because there were lots of photos being taken and, and everybody was, and nobody was paying attention except to their, to, to their cell phone. So what's my excuse? My excuse is that I, I'm, I, this, is my, this is my vocation as a photographer, as a writer. So I observe people. Um, so that's why I take pictures. Basically, you know, I probably talked too much already. Probably said too much. No, no, not at all. Somebody asked a question before about um, asking permission before you take yeah. a photograph. I work in a place that are obsessively concerned that I should have all the permission, all the, you know, every signature and all that kind of stuff arranged before I take photographs or record them on our social media or any of our um, web pages. I don't know whether you've encountered that or thought about that or uh, I have I've encountered that many times and and um, I think it's um, a, a, there's a two, two sides to it, like every story. It's important to 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 protect privacy and it's important to I think with social media being being what it is um, mm -hmm. photos get abused. you know my photos I started putting I don't know if you know I put copyright in my photos because I thought you know somebody's going to take this picture they say well we saw it on the internet we can use it. So there's no respect for copyright. There's no respect for the feelings of the individual. So I'm very careful how I use my picture. So for the picture of the woman in the piazza, I'm saying this is a woman in the piazza and she was there. I'm not saying anything different. But if I say, if I, if I manipulate that picture and use it in a, in a way that is contrary to that, it's morally wrong um, and it's also illegal. But the illegal, illegal part of it, you know, people, people do stuff like that all the time. I've seen my pictures being, they were cropped and changed and, and it's, it's maddening because you can't, you have no control over it. So the, the, the way people deal with it is they want you to write, to sign all kinds of permission slips, which takes away from the spontaneity, of course. I mean, all the pictures that I showed you, I don't have, I don't have a form of permission from anyone other than I have, I think uh, what I would say um, they knew that I was photographing and they agreed to be photographed. For the picture of the, of the, of the woman in the, in the disabled with a wheelchair, uh, there, because we're doing a book on disabilities, um, we actually went and, and there was a sponsor involved. The sponsor wouldn't get involved unless, unless we uh, you know, got permission slips signed. So I got all these permission slips signed. Then I went to a school all the I went to photo one one kid or thirty. All the thirty kids in the class of two, you know, signed the thing. And the teacher actually never gave them, but never. We went through the motion, but we never really followed up with it. Um, no one took it that seriously. But the lawyers take it very seriously. The lawyers in each organization. And if you look at the, if you read what what it says, there were those permissions. That, no, nobody would, you know, you can't photograph anymore, right? And yet we're photographing all the time. So the thing is with a cell phone, no one, no one stops me. I can be in a mall with a cell phone. That's the thing about a cell phone. But if I'm in a mall with, um, you know, a mall looks like a public place, but it's not, it's a private place. So you can be thrown out of a mall. I've been asked to leave with cameras because it's a place where people behave like they do, they, they go shopping, which is normally a kind of a public, public activity, you know? On a store in a, in a storefront situation on the street, but in a mall, it's now a private activity, so you can be thrown out, right? So people now all of a sudden, you know, 
uh, react very differently. I've been asked not to photograph in front of banks. I've been standing in front of a, of a bank building in downtown Toronto on King and Bay. I'm taking pictures. Someone says, security guard comes down and says, sir, you can't stay here. So, well, yes, I can. I'm on the sidewalk. But, you know, like there's this feeling of, so we're, we're, we're actually no longer documenting a lot of things. We're only documenting ourselves, food. People always order food, right? Everything they eat. They put <laughs> Uh, and uh, there's an artist in Mexico who once made a sculpture with all the food that he ate um, in one year. He took a picture of it and then he created a big sculpture of it. He says, this is what I am. <laughs> he was trying to make a statement. It was really funny, actually. Um, anyway, thank you all very much for attending. Thank and you very it's much. Small, it's a small group. If you have any questions, you can just um, email me out of mind. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Vincenzo. Thank you so much. Thanks to everyone who came. It was uh, really nice to see you here. And uh, I just need to officially close this workshop and let you know once again that it was uh, sponsored by um, Employment and Social Development Canada as part of the New Horizons Seniors Program. And uh, well, you've already been to the site, but I've put the link in the chat, uh, there are 10 or 11 um, workshops in all. And uh, we have one coming up. I put it in the chat on July 13th at one o'clock Eastern time. And that is with Anna Nobile, a Vancouver based writer. And the title is Speaking Your Truth, How to Write About Difficult Topics. So if you can join us, please sign up. The link is active to register and um, let people know um, whoever might be interested. And once again, thank you for being here today.